Yeah, it depends, depends on your climate. If you're in a very dry climate like Utah or Nevada, you might let it go for a week. I sometimes let it go for two weeks. I think a week is sufficient, pretty much no matter where you live. So I brush when I built mine. No, this is a very dry climate. Days here. I live in Wisconsin. It's a wet climate. Okay. All right, and then again, uh, for that second layer, I, I lay another course of shorter fibers here, overlapping the long ends of the long fibers laid on this section. And I may begin to build up thickness with very short fibers, maybe two inches long, placed here to bulge out the handle and placed over the ridge section to give it a triangular cross section, peaked here and sloping down gently to the sides of the bow to the edge. Your second layer of sinew, you should also cover up any wood that you inadvertently left uncovered the first time. Now, allow that second layer to cure out. The bow will reflex even further. The limbs may come close to touching. Again, put a new, fresh, slightly taut string between the limbs smear a coat of glue on that second layer and lay down your third layer. The third layer is not laid down in bundles of two or three or four fibers. I lay down single fibers one at a time that cover, uh, that overlap the ends and cover the entire surface of the bowl from here to the other side, corresponding section on the other side, in a perfectly homogeneous seamless layer because that's the layer of the bow that is going to do the most work. The now, what's the layers. diameter of that thread? Now, you can break C down to minuscule, uh, sixteenth of an inch, smallest three-second of an inch. Uh, hair light. Get it as fine as you can. Break it down into hairs. Here's a nice one laying right here. That'll show good, right there. Okay. That's about the size that I lay them down. A little bit, little bit bigger than a human hair, like maybe like a horse hair. Horse hair is a good example. Right. It's about the thickness of uh, hair from the mane of, or tail of a horse. And now you allow that last coating to dry. If you want a more powerful bow, you can put a fourth coating on. But that last coating should be laid down with no seams, no butt joints. It should be homogeneous from end to end. Edges of the sinew slightly overlapping, the ends rather slightly overlapping. And you want that coating of sinew to be about an eighth of an inch deep. At what point do you come to the sides of the bow? I see some threads on the sides overlapping the horn. I or, I've already covered the sides. I usually cover the sides early. And again, if or there's any shrinkage, I cover them again. I make certain that the sides are covered right down, overlapping very slightly onto the horn. And when I build up the top surface of the bow, I like my top surface perfectly flat. So I may lay an extra layer of sinew along the very edge of the working section give me a flat top. That way I have a lot of fibers doing a lot of work on that outer layer. Now Jeff is going to show us what he has come up with as being two or the only two safe methods to string and unstring this <laughs> all this power. Uh, he's got one which is a board but this one he prefers because it's able to carry it and use it in the field. You want to explain it to us? Okay, this consists of two forms. One I have lashed onto the bow to begin with, and they conform to the curvature of the belly of the bow. They've got a slightly concave top surface lined with leather and some holes with ropes, and these are lashed onto the limbs so that they can keep their curvature while you place your knee or something here uh, on the bow and then grab the two limbs and pull inward in a normal bracing motion and slip the string off. Then you can ease up on the limbs and take each limb off of the form separately. Uh, and you only have to worry about one limb at a time because technically each one of these limbs is a separate bow. Now it's only going to go back, it's not going back to its full reflex immediately as you say because it's been strung for quite some time, right? Yeah, this bow has been strung since uh, Thanksgiving time. It's now uh, starting the second week in January. This bow has spent months strung in the past, so it will not retain its, uh, its uh, full reflex uh, for a couple of days, and heat will help it do so. If you keep it warm for a couple of days, uh, it'll retain its full reflex within, say, a week under good conditions mm, being kept okay. warm. So you're just lashing uh, both ends to the form to the limb and what that does is it relaxes that limb or bends it enough mm -hmm. so that it relaxes the string and the string can be removed. All right. right. And then the final extra push is provided by somebody who will unstring the bow in a normal right. motion and then slowly remove these two pieces. This no. is safe. Let's
safe is what we're after. This There's the old Turkish way, the Chinese also used it, very standard way of doing things, and they were very safety conscious. Now we want to remind the viewers here that there's so much power in this bow. You go ahead to work there, Jeff. Okay. Uh, there's so much power in this bow that uh, if something broke that string, if something went wrong, boy, it'd just take the top of your head right off. Extreme, extreme care must be taken. Jerry slips the noose off. Jeffrey relaxes the bow. And that's what we have. Now we take care of each limb separately. Okay. It's critical that both ends of that form are lashed securely. Okay, operation's done. Now in a couple hours, this will regain its full reflex. Keep it warm. Okay, here Jeff is on top. That's the shape of the bow prior to his stringing, what, two months ago, wasn't it? Yeah, this, this bow has spent an enormous amount of time strung, and right now it's it's spent almost two months straight, you know, strung and being shot, being pulled every day. We just got the string off of it. Uh, right now I can actually see it gaining reflex. I can see the limbs moving upward as we speak. What I'm going to do now is uh, just warm the limbs and keep them warm for a while. And after about a week of keeping it warm, it will regain almost all of this curvature, probably two-thirds this much curvature again. Uh, it should reflex back into a nice shallow C shape, or maybe even a deep C shape. But the trick is to keep it warm while it does this, and it is time consuming. The warmer it's kept, the better, the, the quicker it will regain the reflex. Uh, I just warm it up with heating pads. All right, the other method Jeff has come up with for stringing and unstringing bows is uh, board. What, pegboard? What do you call it? Stringing yeah, board? Yeah, this is a stringing board, or you can call it a pegboard. Or I guess uh, some version of this was probably carried by armies in the Middle East back in what I refer to as the good old days, when people still use these in warfare. And what this does is provide a nice convenient platform for you to independently bend and peg down the limbs. And all you need to do is to make sure that everything is nice and strong. Because this, if, again, if this bow gets away from even on this board, uh, you're going to be hurting. So what I do is progressively bend the limbs down into position. But again, first thing you do before you do this is you always heat the bow. We heated the limbs in front of the stove. Well, you heat it also by rubbing with your palm briskly. Yeah, you can rub with your palm in the field if you have to to warm up the bow. You rub real vigorously. The horn just needs to be warm when you're working it. Jeff prefers the forms for this process. He says it's much safer than what the board is because it can twist and get away from you. Yeah, this is not, this might look like it's easy, but this is trickier than the other method. More things can go wrong. It's harder to do by yourself. It, it's, it's actually harder to do by yourself. It's easier to adjust a bow when you have it on this form, though because you can clamp things to the form to set the curvature of the, of the limbs. Note the loose rope to hold the handle. In the 90 degree bend in the hook to help prevent it from kicking out. The board itself is three quarter inch plywood. And 
and here the bow is braced enough or bent enough to be braced uh, to put the string on, which it is now. And I think Jeff is going to give us just a little talk right now on the construction of the bow string since it's a bit different than what most of you would be familiar with. Okay, this bow string happens to be a 1250 pound test. It's uh, made by the endless loop method where you take two pegs, a uh, specified distance apart, and wind string between the two of them, and then the ends are served to form a pair of loops. Then there are a pair of adjustable auxiliary loops that are held in here with double-ended bowline knots. Those knots are self-tightening, but they're very easy to take off and adjust when you release the tension in the, in the knot. Everything is served, even the extra loops are served. Sometimes you can get by with using a sinew loop. That absorbs shock because it stretches a little bit. That was commonly used in Asia. This particular type of string occurs on Turkish bows. An actual bow line would be tied in the end of an ordinary bow string on a Chinese bow. But again, it would have a long loop on the bow line. Why is the long loop? Let's show that. The long loop is needed because if you did not have that long loop, it might be possible for the heel of this loop to slip over the shoulder of the bow. The sia kind of separates the two parts of the loop, the two pieces, and keeps that loop centered on the limb. So that's put there for stability. It's done for stability. This is a string bridge. It's just a piece of antler that's bound onto the bow. It's a little bit wider than the limb. It's a safety feature. It's on there to make certain that that string does not slip over the shoulder of the bow. That can happen. On Chinese bows, those string bridges are usually very large blocks of wood or ivory. These are just little bits of antler. One safety feature that I always put on bows is this strip of horn that's been set into the ear of the bow. That gives it a little bit of extra strength, especially if you've had to violate the grain in that uh, piece of wood. There's also a binding of sinew a little bit closer to the limb than where the knock lies. That's to protect from splitting against the shock of the bowstring. I put a very thick band of sinew on there, but I think it's a smart feature. It's a safety feature. And you can see that the bridge is a little bit wider than the limb. It's put on there with a rounded edge where it comes into contact with the bowstring knot to make certain that I don't cut the bowstring with the bridge. Waterproofing. Everything we're doing, the glue, the sinew, uh, that's holding this bow together, if it got wet, well, you've actually soaked the uh, bows soap to take them apart. Mm -hmm. So you want to keep it dry, basically. Explain us a little bit of what's cooking there. Well, there are a lot of different coverings that you can put on a bow to keep it dry. Uh, very thin leather can be glued over the sinew of the bow, but a uh, common Asian practice was to use the bark of trees, certain types of nearly waterproof bark. This bow has strips of paper birch glued onto it, and they all overlap slightly, and they cover all of the sinew right down, overlapping onto the belly and covering a little bit of the horn. The horn is polished black, and then you can lacquer or varnish the bow with something like a sandarac resin or copal or damar varnish to enhance the waterproofing. But you should keep in mind that when you glue this bark on the bow, the bark is nearly waterproof. Use as little water as you have to to get the glue fluid and allow the bow a long, long time to lose that water because this will tra the, the bark will trap the water from the glue and you don't want the bow to rot, so it'll allow a long time for it to dry out. Well, I know that I hear in the American Indian part, people talk about using snakeskins a lot. I, you've used snakeskin on one, anyhow. Right. Does it really help a lot? I feel that it, it probably does uh, help against incidental or, or accidental soakings. Uh, it, it may act as a barrier to mist, but if you really soak one of these bows, it will come apart on you. Okay. So it's, 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 it will help you out in an accident, but it's not something that's going to absolutely make your bow permanently waterproof. Okay, well now we got the bow, which in your case that bow is, what, right at 100 pounds? This bow shoots about 100 pounds at 27, 28 inches. And now we don't want to just go shooting any old arrow out of that. 